You are listening to The Addiction Files, where we discuss evidence-based treatment, clinical pearls and resources, while striving to destigmatize the treatment of addiction in our medical culture and save lives. We are the addiction doctors, Dr. Darlene Peterson and Paula Cook. Welcome to The Addiction Files, and we are thrilled. It is such. It is our honor and our privilege to have Dr. George Koob from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, or the NIAAA, joining us. So it is it is our privilege to have you here today. So thank you so much for joining us. And if I can just indulge for just a minute, Dr. Koob, I remember this probably would have been back in 2008 or 2009. I was just coming out of residency and in my training. And that was probably the first time I have heard you speak many times, but that was probably the first time I heard you speak. And you gave uh, one of your lectures on just the neurobiology of addiction. And I was hooked. It was just so fascinating as you were going through and teaching us. And that was what I was seeing in my patients. And it was just so clinically relevant. So I appreciate all your work over the years. And I'm really excited today to just talk about definitely some of the consequences, what we're seeing, and then what we can what we can do to help our patients. So I'm going to turn it over to you to just, even though most in the addiction world, you need no introduction, but introduce yourself and then we'll get started. Darling, thank you very much for the kind words. I, I'm uh, George Koob. I'm the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. But I also have a, an active basic research laboratory at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, where we study uh, what I basically call the, the negative emotional side of addiction and the neurocircuitry that's involved in, in mediating those kind of effects of, of, of drugs and alcohol. I still work on alcohol in both places. so. Great. And then I think that's, you know, where we really are interested. I think our learners will be really interested in in hearing you speak about that, Dr. Koob. You know, alcohol is probably one of our favorite topics on our podcast. We have learners that are mostly medical, although we have a lot of behavioral health learners and educators and uh, law enforcement, kind of everybody and a lot of lay people. And because of this work that you've done with, you know, the negative affect state that occurs in the brain, and the central nervous system with people who are stuck in this cycle of, of either alcohol use or other substance abuse. It, I would love you to talk more about that and the work that you've done and the work that's ongoing um, over at NIDA as well. Tell us a bit more about that. So uh, I'll try and make this as concise as possible, but um, it, it was a, a long time ago that I used to teach at the University of California, San Diego undergraduates about addiction. They were very large classes, and if you've ever tried to teach undergraduates about addiction, you know it can be uh, challenging. So one of the things I did is develop a course called uh, Impulse Control Disorders, and in the process of developing that course, I noticed that all addictions, not only drug addictions and not only alcohol addiction, but also non-drug addictions like gambling or compulsive eating or even compulsive exercise, they all had a some common elements. And that's where, from whence came the three-stage addiction cycle. And so I began to realize that there was some sense to the addiction process and how it evolved. And so we, at that time, defined the binge intoxication stage, which encodes reward, pleasure, incentive salience, a withdrawal negative affect stage, which is what everybody thinks of as withdrawal, but we were thinking more of the fact that during withdrawal, people are miserable, basically, in simple terms, and exacerbation or worsening of negative emotions. And then uh, the craving stage, or the we call it the preoccupation anticipation stage, which is, um, you know, uh, deficits in executive function, but characterized by a, a yearning and a real desire to to retake a, a drug or, or re-engage in gambling, for example. And so over the years since then, and this was in, in the 1980s, we, you know, we have um, 
basically, through a lot of research and not just my laboratory, begun to understand that these three stages are manifest in human beings, been validated, that these three stages uh, encode those dysfunctions that I talked about, and that they are mediated by different circuits in the brain. And so, you know, the reward system is well documented, involves chemicals like dopamine and opioid peptides or endorphins, you know, is largely focused on the basal ganglia of subs- uh, part of our brain deep in the front part of our brain that um, even lizards have a basal ganglia. It's what gets us moving, motivated, doing things, but also provides, you know, the pleasure of, of doing things. And then the amygdala um, in, and circuits in the amygdala, fight or flight part of our brain, which is deep in the temporal lobe, mediate the withdrawal negative affect stage. And the cravings are frontal cortex, which is the one that's so slow to develop. In fact, probably doesn't fully develop in humans till early 20s, you know, is what encodes uh, executive function and, and mediates craving. And so, you know, this is what we know as the three stage Three part, a three stage cycle of addiction, but three functional domains, and three neural circuits that are that are involved. And you know, the frontal cortex is kind of like your super ego in some ways. It's controlling, you know, your reptile brain, the basal ganglia, and the reward system. But it's also controlling your stress system. And so, if you know, if drugs are affecting that, they're obviously then affecting your emotional system. And if you put it all together, you, you realize that, you know, people take drugs initially to feel good because they're activating the reward system. But ultimately, you end up basically taking drugs not to feel bad. And, you know, that's a that's a quote that I often use. But, it, you know, what we forget is that that feeling good doesn't last. All right. There. It's a word that's not used that much anymore these days, but you develop tolerance. And so, you know, think of the first drink of alcohol you have at a party and, you know, it, you know that wave of relaxation that comes over you, a mild euphoria, and you feel top of the world maybe for a little bit of time, but that wears off after an hour or so. And so you might spend the rest of the evening trying to chase that pleasurable effect and it, it, you don't regain it. Um, in its in its full flavor, and and in fact, the more you drink, the more likely you are the next day to have a raging hangover, which, in my opinion, is a mild withdrawal syndrome. And and if you think about that as a cycle where you re-engage, you end up fixing the you're trying to fix the problem with a drug that's making the problem worse. And and so that's my mini view of alcohol use disorder, substance use disorder in general, uh, and and a kind of neurobiological framework on it. Perfect. And so this notion, I mean, we've all been taught, I think, preliminarily about addiction as this reward system uh, process. And, and yet this really speaks to this negative affect state, which then drives it much more probably than the reward, like you're saying, because of tolerance. And you talk about um, this term hyperkatifia, which again, like Darlene and I were introduced during your scientific presentations at conferences, but it's not kind of a well-known term out in public. So do you want to describe that more? I mean, I know you've already talked about negative affect state, but would you, can you describe that a little bit more? And especially the duration people can live in that state. It's not necessarily, is it short-lived? Is it long-lived? And is there anything that we can particularly do to target it? Yeah, no, it's, it's my favorite word because I made it up. And it's actually now, in you can find it in Wikipedia on, on a search engine. Um, it, hyperkatifia was coined in 2010 by myself and two anesthesiologists that I worked with, medical doctors, uh, Joe Sherman, San Diego, who uh, has a clinical practice. And, and Howard Gutstein, who at the time was at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And, uh, and it, you know, I, I basically, there's a coop story with everything. So I, my brother, Steve, is an archaeologist, conservator, speaks Greek fluently. So I called him up and I said, I need a word for negative emotional state in Greek. And he gave me katifia. 
And I just stuck hyper on it. Okay, it's that simple. So it's a hypersensitive negative emotional state. And it's analogous to hyperalgesia, which you both know as a state of uh, increased sensitivity to pain, which could be caused by an injury. But uh, hyperalgesia can also be caused by chronic alcohol use and chronic opioid use. And so um, that's hyperkatephia. And then actually, it was only last year I gave a talk at the alcohol and stress meeting in, in Volterra, Italy, and, and the, 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 I coined the term protracted hyperkatephia, which comes to your second part of your question, which is some of these symptoms persist for months and years after cessation of chronic drug use um, and alcohol use and opioid use in particular. And so people call it protracted abstinence or protracted withdrawal. But I actually coined the term protracted hyperkatephia because, you know, the physical signs that everybody always likes to focus on with withdrawal often disappear rapidly. And, and some drugs like marijuana and, and nicotine, you know, and even cocaine, it's hard. You're hard pressed to come up with physical signs. And, and, and if I may continue to preach, you know, I don't think individuals with a severe alcohol use disorder are drinking because they have a tremor during withdrawal. They're drinking because they're miserable during mm -hmm. withdrawal, okay? They hurt all over. They, you know, it's a flu-like state, you know, they're irritable, they're cranky, they, you know, everything is gray, nothing feels good. Pleasurable activities are no longer pleasurable. So you lose your reward system and you gain your stress system in hyperkatephia, both of which contribute to hyperkatephia. You can think of it in simplistic terms that you've know, depleted the dopamine system, and there's some evidence for that. You certainly downregulated its activity. So, you know, you're no longer getting that dopamine burst, but you're also heavily engaged and activated your brain stress systems, the, some of which drive your you know, pituitary adrenal axis, but others just make you miserable, like dynorphin, which is, a, a, you know, the, the opioid peptide that's a, aversive to every mammal I'm aware of, including human beings, when it's, when it's expressed and overexpressed. So these misery neurotransmitters are activated, and you, if you will, your pleasure transmitters are deactivated during hyperkatephia. And some of those effects, you know, last for, for a long time and they get re-engaged by a stressful event. Uh, event. And, and, and so you may be sailing along okay, and then suddenly out of the blue, you know, this in, internal kind of state gets triggered and it could be anything, you know, it could be a reprimand from your boss or it could be, um, you know, some loss of a friend uh, or, or, you know, any, any event can trigger a, 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 like a reawakening of this negative emotional state. And that often drives relapse. Oh, thank you. That's, that's awesome. Where are we on like current research for and treatment options, and particularly for alcohol use disorders during this negative affect state? It is the most challenging clinically to treat when we have patients. We see it. I mean, you just described what I probably see daily in my office, but we feel like such a loss and helpless sometimes as physicians to treat this. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. And, and I totally agree with you. I mean, I have more trouble convincing basic researchers about hyperkatephia than I do clinical researchers because clinical researchers know exactly what I'm talking about. But rats express the same symptoms if you if you utilize measures of, you know, rats will avoid places where they experience hyperkatephia, let's put it that way. So, so the answer is, you know, in the alcohol field, we have a camprosate, which is, 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 is effective. It helps some people. It basically blocks the glutamate surge that's associated with alcohol withdrawal. And glutamate's an excitatory neurotransmitter that certainly contributes to the irritability and some of the symptoms of hyperkatephia. Um, Acamprosate's not a terribly powerful drug, okay? If those of you who know about it, it, it takes grams to work three times a day. Um, 
And actually, it's a taurine derivative. And most people don't even know that. It's calcium homotaurine. Taurine's a neuro, neuromodulator that's in our brains that, that's like um, GABA that suppresses uh, activity. So presumably, you know, a camprosate has some beneficial effects and can be used. But people have to take it. They have to take it three times a day. And, and usually it's recommended to be taken after you go through acute withdrawal. So that's another issue. But, it, you know, people find it useful. And there's, there's some work at the Mayo Clinic where they've been able to identify those people who actually respond to a camprosate versus those that don't and what biomarkers kind of indicate that. So there's been some progress in that regard. In the alcohol field, we don't have anything else really that's approved by the FDA that works on the the hyperkatifia domain. Now, trexone, of course, blocks the pleasurable effects of, of alcohol, and that's effective as well. Um, but there are some other medications that are that are uh, on the VA formulary, and they're recommended by the APA as secondary um, treatments. One is gabapentin, which seems to help with some of the sleep disturbances associated with alcohol withdrawal. Um, has there been some positive positive clinical trials. Dr. Mason at, at uh, Scripps Research has done pioneering work in this area. And so gabapentin is one that's used. Um, and then topiramate has been, been used in clinical trials, some positive clinical trials uh, with alcohol and PTSD in particular. You know, each, each of these drugs have some form of side effects that have to be considered. But the, the only three approved by the FDA for alcohol use disorder are, of course, antabuse, which makes you sick if you drink, and then naltrexone and, and, and a camprosate. In the opiate field, you know, you, you, you both know that there is a buprenorphine, which is very effective, and that's a partial agonist, but it's often hard to get people off of the last few milligrams of buprenorphine. Um, it, you know, it, but it does treat the hyperkatifia, but then you do also have to, you often have people who are still, in a sense, dependent on opioids, because if they abruptly stop buprenorphine, they're going to go through withdrawal, and they really have to be tapered off. Sometimes they just maintain them, on, uh, individuals on, on, on buprenorphine. Methadone is a full agonist, so in a sense, you're substituting methadone for the opioid that you've been misusing. Um, in in the you know tobacco, there's varenicline, which is another partial agonist. So it's like buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is to opiates like varenicline is to nicotine, and it actually works. It's been proven to be effective. It not only blocks the rewarding effects of smoking if you start smoking but it blocks the withdrawal associated with cessation of smoking, just like buprenorphine blocks the rewarding effects of opiates if you start taking them and blocks the withdrawal if you stop taking opioids. So that's, that's a kind of brief overview of the medications that are available in addiction. You know, I'm, um, I'm very positive about partial agonists because I think they can occupy the receptor and they have less efficacy in activating the receptor, but they cling to it really tightly. So nothing else can get in there. And so, you know, I think there are efforts around the world to develop better partial agonists. Um, there's efforts in the, in the marijuana field to be looking at uh, uh, antagonists that attack, you know, only one of the uh, second messenger systems. And it will hopefully have similar effects as a partial agonist, or there may be allosteric modulators where you bind to a different site than the primary site that could also act as um, partial agonists. So, you know, I think there's there's some hope coming along in basic research in medications. But they're not only medications, they're behavioral treatments. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a very effective treatment for hyperkatifia, but you have to do it. I mean, you have to, you know, I would go so far as to say that Alcoholics Anonymous is a reasonably good treatment for hyperkatifia. There's nothing more powerful as, as, a, as a reinforcer to make up for that deficit in reward than another human being. 
And so you don't have to do Alcoholics Anonymous. You can do other 12-step programs. You can do other group programs. You can go to outpatient programs that have groups. But working with other people who are going through the same suffering that you've been going through and working through how you are using alternatives um, and rebuilding your reward system and re-establishing a normal baseline for your stress system. Any way you can do that, mindfulness is being used in conjunction with cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and sometimes on its own. And, and I hate to tell you this, and I say this a lot, but if you were to ask any of the other 26 institute directors what would be good for their disease, whether it's heart disease or uh, gastrointestinal disease or um, depression or you know, you name it, they're going to say exercise. And so, you know, I'd say the same thing about addiction. Um, exercise is great for your body. It's great for your brain. It gets the juices flowing. It, it occupies you in a very healthy way to, um, um, n n instead of sitting around ruminating over, you know, the negative thoughts that constitute the cognitive part of hyperkatifia. So I think, I think those are the, you know, and I'm hopeful. I mean, I know we're funding uh, research in this area, but I'm hopeful that um, elements of telehealth and telemedicine, um, things like uh, um, trans um, magnetic stimulation of parts of the brain as it gets more sophisticated, um, better behavioral techniques, and and again. Um, medicines that can re reestablish homeostasis in your emotional system. I think those are all going to be future treatments for addiction. It's really <clears> thorough. <throat> and you're speaking to the choir when we when you speak about all those things and especially, you know, social connectedness, mindfulness, exercise. We we really encourage those things for our patients, too, because we've seen them work. And and again, time to disencouraging people that time will help them uh, get better. And I'm sure you've seen that in, in studies as well. Yeah, time, it, it's a really important point you raise. Um, we forget about the fact that the, that the brain, even though we don't grow new neurons, the brain is, is plastic. And what we know from the alcohol field is that individuals can recover. They can recover cognitive function to be just like a person who doesn't have a history of alcohol use disorder. And I'm talking about you know, moderate to severe alcohol use disorder. And, and, but when you image their brains, and this was work done by E.D. Sullivan and, and Dolph Efferbaum at, at Stanford, when you image their brains, the people who had a history of alcohol use disorder and the people who never had a history of alcohol use disorder are using different pathways. So where, where are you two located? What part of the country? We're in Utah. Oh. Different parts of Utah, but Utah. Well, I-70 probably goes through Utah or something like that. <laughs> so, so the individuals with no history of alcohol use disorder are using I-70. But the people who have recovered from an alcohol use disorder are using the side roads. But they get there anyway. They get there just the same. The only difference is the ones in recovery are always vulnerable, you know, because maybe the stressor will be much larger and they, they're they lacking I-70, okay? Absolutely. And so we need, we need time for those, for those additional strengthening of circuits to kick in. So that's the time connection. You can tell us a little bit about some of the public health policies surrounding like alcohol use. And are there any particular ones that you would like to see implemented? Well, I'm not allowed to comment uh, on policy as as part of NIH. So, you know, <laughs> we do study policy and I can say what we've studied is that, you know, uh, anything that limits the availability of alcohol generally decreases drinking, right? So, you know, if a, if an area around a school is full of outlets where people can go and get alcohol versus uh, uh, an area around another school that has no outlets, you, you can, you get the picture. So availability is a, is a key issue and you can, 
you can extend that to carding of young people. You can, ex you know, uh, are you allowing people uh, fake uh, uh, IDs to 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 buy at bars? Um, is, you know, so th those are all all factors that that contribute. And and outlet density is, is correlates with drinking. Okay, flat out. Um, you know. There, there are complicated relationships with with the pricing. So you know, it's not a simple one to one relationship. But in general, you know, the more a commodity costs, the less the commodity is used. With alcohol, you know, it it gets tricky because there are low cost versions and high cost versions, and so on and so forth. But you know, again, it, those are. Anything that limits the availability in a policy, it, it can be effective. Um, we have what we call the um, college aim, which was put yeah. together before I came to, to NIAAA. So that was over 10 years ago. But it's a list of prevention options uh, on the individual basis for universities and colleges and a list of community options. And so, uh, you know, outlet density, carding, you know, availability uh, of drinking places on college campus would be in the community domain. Something you may have even taken called alcohol EDU and those kind of um, uh, prevention programs um, are some of the individual ones. And we list all of, of them. Uh, it's on our website and, and they're listed by effectiveness and also by how much they cost as programs. But that gives you some picture of, of some of the things that, that help prevent. And many of them involve, you know, uh, elements of policy that can be implemented by a local community, by a university itself, and so forth. No, so it's, it's a do, great resource, yes. So what we do is, we study policies to see what effects they have, but we can't recommend policies on our own. Well, That's up to the voters to do with their community and decide how they want to approach it. Well, it's interesting because like we've seen on the minimum legal drinking age and how, and, and we yeah. see that in practice that the delay when people are first exposed to alcohol, because there's this trend now this very disturbing trend, I have to add, where if parents will just monitor alcohol use of teens and and provide it in the home in a safe place, that that's somehow like more acceptable, which is in, and but then studies which you monitored and conducted, which we've seen, which and we see personally because many of our patients that we're doing intakes on much later this early alcohol exposure, I don't need to tell you this, on shade of very adverse outcomes. And so having those older minimum legal drinking ages is associated with less risk of abuse and less risk of heavy use later. So there's there's that we've seen. And then I and I think we've seen when they've other countries, I think, I think you cited on your website that even New Zealand, when they lowered their drinking age, there was a study that from 20 to 18, they saw an increase in teen drinking. Am I, am I correct there? So I'm, I'm, I don't remember the number myself on the New Zealand study, but absolutely, we've had a steady straight line decline in highway deaths due to alcohol since Reagan, it was Ronald Reagan, um, instituted the 21-year-old drinking age. And we're going to be monitoring what happened in Utah because I believe they've, um, they've, they've changed one of the laws there uh, associated with drinking. Um, yeah, the, the legal limit for alcohol here is different. It's 0 0.05 as opposed to 0 0.08. Maybe that's what it is. That's the one. So yeah. we'll be monitoring how that changes uh, mm -hmm. drinking patterns as well. So that's what we do. Absolutely. And you're absolutely correct about the minimum drinking age. I mean, that 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 was a big, big uh, uh, effect and, and remains so. And and a number of European countries now are going the other direction. You know, they're, they're raising their 
drinking age. And, and then the hosting party idea that you can train young people to drink properly is completely false. Yeah. Um, I've Thank never you. Seen a positive, I've never seen a positive study on it. Uh, and, you know, this idea that in Europe, uh, you know, they can train their young people to drink properly is simply false, too. I, you know, I have a very close relationship with French neuroscience community and, and addiction community, and they have as big a problem with binge drinking in France as we do with young people. And, you know, it, it's just not true. And, and even some of our latest studies indicate that even individuals who have a couple sips of alcohol are more likely to have problems later on, much less, you know, actually engaged in, in drinking. So, you know, you know, as one of my colleagues says cynically, you know, the hosting problems actually train people to binge drink. It's not the other way around. Absolutely. And so this this brings up something that we're both really passionate about and that and you are, too, as an organization is just messaging and changing kind of public messaging, which kind of ties into harm reduction, which we associate more with opioid use disorder and stimulants. But, you know, we're interested in how the NIAAA has really it seems to have expanded its reach in terms of resources and messaging about the danger of alcohol, especially to, to vulnerable groups, more vulnerable, like women, pregnant women, adolescents, older adults. And, you know, we're frustrated all day going around treating mostly alcohol use disorder folks at an age where people are mostly concerned about opioids. And I'm not disregarding, we're not, of course, disregarding the harms related to opioid use. But is there anything that that you think will further this messaging about the fact that alcohol is extremely dangerous to, to anyone, just depends on the spectrum of danger, really, you know, in vulner, according to vulnerability? Well, one factoid, as I call them, that, that that really seems to get the attention of audiences when I do public lectures is actually from my one of our co-institutes, and, and that is NCI, the National Cancer Institute, now attributes five to six percent of cancer is due to alcohol, and you know we've always known about breast cancer increased probability in females who drink and it's incremental the more you drink the more the more the higher the probability we have also also no, always known about esophageal cancer especially with um you know the acetaldehyde peaks that are associated with that but um but there was a there was a news thing uh, today on bowel cancer and so that gets people's attention but we but to take it back a step you know, from little individual vignettes, we've made a concerted effort. I think it started just probably prior to the pandemic, and the pandemic really exacerbated um, hyperkatifia, if you really want to know. I mean, the isolation, the, the stress, the worry about getting infected, the, the worry about your job being there when, when things got back together, and all of these stressors really you know, we had a big jump in alcohol consumption and a big jump in deaths associated with alcohol. And 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 it really brought home um, what we had already started planning to do, which is this changing the conversation about alcohol, we call it. It's our program. And, you know, the, the dry January movement has really caught on and got a lot of press this year. I do I, I the first week in January of the year, I do 20 press interviews on dry January in one day, um, one morning, long morning day, um, you know, for outlets all over the country. And and it really starting. I think we're starting to to get some traction in, in this regard. I think people are starting to pay attention. Um, but, you know, we got a lot. We, we have more to do and and we're struggling with how to do that just like you are um you know I, i'll i'll tell you my my dream my dream would be that alcohol would be considered the fifth vital sign um in in a primary care or any health clinic's office and that you would the physician or nurse's assist, assistant or nurse or physician's assistant or anyone even clinical psychologists board certified addiction medicine specialist I, I you know it doesn't matter to me who asks the questions but if you, if you just ask people how much they drink how much their friends drink 
um, and, and then actually do some intervention, like maybe some element of motivational interviewing, like, you know, sir or young lady, you know, some of the things you've come to the office for today could be due to your alcohol consumption. Or do you realize how much money you're spending on alcohol each week if you're drinking that much? You know, you could do a lot of fun things with with those fun with that. Uh, anyway, you get the picture. So, um, you know, m my dream is that it, second dream is that, you know, I, I, I want to try and educate Americans on what is a standard drink, because, you, you know, the old cartoon where somebody's holding a glass of wine and it's the size of a liter bottle and they say, I only have one drink a day. But, you know, I don't know that people really understand, you know, five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer, 12 ounces of a, a, a seltzer, um, you know, 1.5 ounces of, of distilled beverage. That's a drink, not three shots. OK, yeah, we get a huge response from medical students when we teach addiction medicine modules on what a standard drink is, because, of course, they all, you know, as well as what the definition of binge drinking is. We always get a lot of chuckles and, you know, elbows in the ribs because even our our own you know, colleagues and medical students, residents don't understand this concept. And and I agree with you from a clinical perspective. People are hungry for education and it's amazing how misguided they are on the effects of alcohol. Like we I talk, we see a lot of females because obviously Darlene and I attract that population and women just don't know that alcohol contributes to breast cancer risk or is responsible for their hypertension or contributes to their anxiety and insomnia or their rosacea. So it's just, yeah, education is key and, and adding it as a fifth vital sign that's that's wonderful. We support that. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll further the work in the podcast, absolutely, by, by, by talking yeah, and, more. About and the other factoid that goes with that is that women are more vulnerable than men. Um, yeah. it, it, multiple reasons, obviously, you know, the blood alcohol levels tend to go higher for women for for body distribution, uh, water distribution reasons. But but they also seems to be some you know, uh, increased vulnerability uh, above and beyond that for a whole variety of of everything from comorbidity with depression to to liver disease. So, you know, it, it really is. Um, and, and we're now finally, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, but we're now finally studying both females and males in preclinical basic research, just like we've been doing in clinical research. And finally, in clinical research, we're actually analyzing the data between males and females, which we never did before. So, you know, I, I hope that we'll start to understand some of the bases for, for those differences as well. I think, I think we'll just cover some of the resources also that NIAAA has. Some of them, Paula and I know, we have used for years. I do have to make just one comment. I love definitely the dry January is catching on. I think the first time ever I've had two patients that showed up in my office specifically just saying that they were doing dry January. And it was actually really kind of nice for me. And I just give them out the rethinking, rethink your drinking pamphlets that I've been giving out for years, but it was actually nice that it was something that the patient came in asking for help. And I was like, well, you know what? Here you go. Let's talk about this. So that's that's a fantastic resource that I have used. And I think it's exactly what you talked about, that can we just one ask, you know, about the patient's alcohol use? And that's a regular thing. And yeah, I, I kind of sound like a broken record with my mid-levels whenever they come to me with any patient with out of control, like hypertension or their blood counts off, or they have any kind of any kind of other medical condition, I always ask, well, what's their alcohol use? And they're always like, Ugh. and I'm like, it's always the alcohol. <laughs> you know, so they're kind of always annoyed with me about that. But that's why I I couldn't just say it better the way you did. So I appreciate that. But oh. You know, I mean, other resources, what other things should we be, what other messages should we be getting out there? 
Yeah, well, I'm going to give you a couple, but uh, just to yeah. mention that, yeah. you know, on the drive home, they do think about the question you ask them too. So, you know, it's yes. not, you know, you get grief for it, just so you know. Um, <laughs> we even, do. Even, and, and we all tend to lie probably a little bit when somebody's asking us about something that's not good for us, but but we think about it, hopefully. Yeah, so Rethinking drinking is one of our most popular. I mentioned College Aim, which is um, for universities and college administrators, but anybody sending their child um, to college or university might want to take a look at it. Um, and then we have the NI AAA Treatment Navigator. And we did yeah. this in collaboration with the SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. But it, it actually tells you what is an alcohol use disorder, the spectrum, it tells you about the spectrum of treatments, which we've discussed. But it also, you can um, type in your zip code and find a treatment facility in your locale. So it's, it's um, something people may want to check out, maybe not for themselves, maybe for a loved one. And then um, for you two, I'm, you, I'm assuming you've seen our, our HPCR, as we call it, lovingly, but it's the uh, Healthcare Professional Core Resource on Alcohol. Yeah. But, you know, anybody um, could look at that. It's pretty much everything you wanted to know about alcohol. And we spent most of the pandemic working on that. And, and so if you want to know what NIAAA did during the pandemic, that's one of the things we did during the pandemic. <laughs> and, you know, it's very comprehensive. It covers everything uh, from how to do a, you know, a screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. It talks about the medical conditions that we three have been talking about. It talks about what is an alcohol use disorder. It talks about the different treatments, which we covered a bit today. A, a little bit of biology and neurobiology. There's even a whole section on drug interactions. What pills should you not take when you're drinking yes. alcohol, or what? It pills that you are taking, you shouldn't be doing alcohol with, et cetera. So, um, you know, I highly recommend the, the HPCR. But in general, the simplest thing is to just type into your search engine NIAAA, and you will find everything on our website. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, anyone who looks at our website and, and still has questions, there's a place to interact with NIAAA. We, we'd love feedback. It's a living document. We can change it. But all of these the rethinking drinking, the treatment navigator, the HPCR, they're all on the website, so they can be found. Thank, and also get and you can earn CME uh, from the healthcare right. core resource as well, which is really an excellent resource. And we we put it out on our podcast as a resource for our learners as well. It's excellent, and all of these are available in Spanish too, of course. So that's also important for folks to know, especially in terms of the um, actual product to give people pamphlets and have ordered, we give those out in our rural county jail. So just, you know, we have those circulating down in little parts of Utah, but thank you for that. The resources are, are valued and definitely used. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, absolutely. Um, you guys are two of the most informed individuals I've had interviews with in a long time. So I'm <laughs> very pleased to do this. We'll take that as a compliment. This thank is you so much. That was meant as a compliment. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. We're passionate about, about the message and we passionate, we love our work. And so it's, it's, it's really wonderful to be aligned and we're evidence-based. We try and deliver evidence-based information out into for free to to people who want to learn more because we realized our colleagues our medical students our residents really don't have a great fund of knowledge around addiction medicine and that's why the stigma perpetuates people don't access treatment and uh, we, we want to in some small way change that so we really appreciate you joining us though dr coop as a busy person and we we value that you uh, were able to do that well, it's been a real pleasure talking with you, and that's another compliment. So um, thanks for having me today, and thanks for your interest, and thanks for everything you're doing to, to help uh, educate the public in this domain and help your own patients. So greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. We can we appreciated all your knowledge and teaching us over the years. So I, I can't thank you enough for your time today. Until next time.
Hey, check us out at theaddictionfiles.com or email us at theaddictionfiles at gmail.com. Thank you so much to Ricky Valides for use of his song, Awake. Check him out at rickyvalides.com. purposes only. Hosts and guests are not responsible for any harm caused by information obtained from the source. As each person is unique, you're advised to seek the advice of your own healthcare professional to treat any medical conditions you may be having. Opinions expressed on the show are those of the addiction files and not of our respective employers.